you know, I had I had no money. I was buying snowmobiles with credit cards. <laughs> Welcome to the Snow West Show from our mountain snowmobiling headquarters in Idaho for over 45 years. Here's your host, Ryan Harris. Hey everybody, welcome to the Snow West Show. This is a, we're back with another episode of the Snow West Podcast. This is something new again that we're doing. We still do the magazine, we still do the website, we still do everything that Snow West does, but we're adding a podcast because... That's all we need is more stuff to do, right? That's right. <laughs> um, our podcast is available currently on our YouTube channel, Snow West Magazine, and uh, we're setting up the RSS feed, and it will be available this coming week on iTunes, which, which I guess is Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all the major podcast outlets. So tune in for that. Um, we had our first episode we released last week, uh, Heidi McNary and Troy Halverson from Arctic Cat, your old buddies. Uh, talking about the new Catalyst platform, that was that was really interesting. That was a great conversation. Like Heidi really opened up. I was I was surprised at how in depth they went because they introduced that sled to us at Heydays, and then you know Donna was like, "Here's what you can say, and if you say anything beyond that, I'll kill you." <laughs> and so we we can really talk about a whole lot of stuff, but Heidi and Troy got on that podcast and they they went pretty in depth. Like Troy's you know Troy's been out on it as a uh, not, he's not an engineer anymore, but that's his background. So he's ridden it and he's been around it and it was cool to hear him talk about that snowmobile. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, let me introduce our co host for today. This is part of the snow West test crew. We have Justin Stevens, uh, former marketing director for yep. motor fist, yep. motor fist gear, yeah. uh, athlete manager. For a time uh, being. Yep. For kind of did a lot of different things. Pro so. Probably had four <laughs> or five different jobs over there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, you you went to Japan with uh, Rob and Dave. Yeah, that was a good time. Hung out so, with them. That was a lot of fun. We made a video. Just wanted to capture some of what what went on over in Japan. So, and that that was kind of a last minute trip, wasn't it? Yeah, a little bit. They told me about it in the fall, and then it kind of went away. And all of a sudden, I had to get everything together to go. So I think I had to expedite a, my passport because it was <laughs> it was uh, out of date. So but, well. Not, not too many people can say they've been sledding in Japan. Yeah, it was Doesn't definitely work. one of those once in a lifetime when somebody says, you, do you want to go? And the answer is just yes, <laughs> even though you don't have time. So. Yep, yep. Uh, and then Brock Jenna, uh, also a test rider for Snow West, also a Motorfist alum. Yeah, you Motorfist were, alum. You were uh athlete manager there for a while. What, I, what did you do there? I was sales, district sales manager. District sales. Yep. Yeah. And then that led to your... Stint at Arctic Cat. Yep. Uh, also a few years at Arctic Cat. Okay. Was that, uh, you were district sales manager at Arctic Cat, regional sales rep? What? what I was district sales manager at Arctic Cat, regional at uh, Motorfest. Okay. Which meant pretty much covering the whole country. So you, at the Motorfest time. You know some dealerships. I know a lot of dealerships, yeah. You've been in and out of places. Yep. And it was great, great being with Motorfest. So I was in and out of, you know, all the, all the OEMs. We were, you know, we were selling with all the OEMs at that time. Um, you know, and then once they, once they sold to, to Arctic Cat, I, I became a, an Arctic Cat district sales manager and, you know, mainly focused on selling Arctic Cat product to the, to the Arctic Cat dealers. Okay. You, you missed that? You haven't been doing that for a while. You, you're both now like in the home building business. You're, you do exteriors and you, you build mansions all over, homes. all over yeah. the custom homes. area. <laughs> and we actually work a little bit together. So. Yeah. You share an office I hear. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's something new. That's something new. We'll talk. We'll have, we'll have a podcast on that yeah. a little bit down the road. <laughs> That's an entire show in, on its own, right? You know, yeah. I, I get that question all the time. Uh, do I do I miss miss uh, Arctic Cat working with Arctic Cat? And you know, we're here. We're riding with you, still in the snowmobile industry. So I would say, you know, yeah, we we, we both we both kind of miss a little bit because we're we're in here in here with you now. Yeah, so sure. yeah, and that's it's been fun to watch you because you. You spent so many years just writing Arctic Cats, and we're hanging out with Rob and Dave, and I think you were a little heavily influenced by that. And you were you were very much an Arctic Cat guy. Yeah, I mean, I was I was riding Arctic Cat before I actually started working for Arctic Cat. In my Motorfist days, I started riding Arctic Cat, and and I I really liked it. So, yeah, 
so it's been fun as we have we been doing the snow west test stuff and snowshoot and dealer you know deep powder challenges and that and having you guys come around and ride watching you adapt to the polaris and to the skidoo um the yamaha you already got that pretty much done. <laughs> I, I i think you're pretty comfortable on the yamaha from what i could tell yamaha yeah yeah it was for some reason it felt a lot like the arctic cat yeah <laughs> but, but just wa- watching watching you adapt to the skidoo and the polaris and and take what you are you know take the the muscle memory and what you understand on the arctic cat from handling and everything and adapting that to d- a different platform and a different chassis it's, it's kind of fun watching that that process i can i can honestly say that this you know this last winter when i wasn't with arctic cat i spent more time on a non-arctic cat snowmobile this year than i have in the last 10 years and it was yeah it it was, it was really fun all right. Um, um, our our guest for this show, I was telling you guys before the show, our guest for this show that we're going to get to here in a few minutes, we, we shot a segment at Heydays, and I've, I've wanted to do this for a long time, just start getting some of these guys that uh, kind of pioneered the backcountry snowmobile movement, um, get them together and just let them talk. Like, I, it's not a and I don't want to do Q&A podcasts. I, you know, right. I, I, want, I want a group of guys to get together and talk the same way they do in the trailer when you're going riding. Right. Just capture that conversation. So we got... Blair Morgan, uh, Dan Adams, and Chris Morant together and just sat them down. And, and in my mind, those guys pioneered modern backcountry riding. Yeah, riding sure. style, techniques. You know, Blair Blair can really take sole credit for standing up, like like the the whole geometry of the snowmobile being built around stand-up riding stuff. Right. I think that comes from Blair. That Dan Adams, you know, and, and Blair, Blair's a five-time X Games gold medalist. He's, uh, I believe, 12-time pro snowcross champion. I, yeah. I don't know. This is, you didn't really follow snowcross back then. Not, no, not that much. Do, do you know who Blair is? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. You know who Blair is. <laughs> um, and five-time Canadian motocross champion. Like, this this dude's won a lot of stuff, you know. Yeah. And, and And to get him together with, with Dan... Dan, who's really perfected the clinics, who's an OG Slednecks guy. You know, it, it was his crew, his snowboarding yeah. buddies that, that started Slednecks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it all started, Dan kind of tells the story of like Slednecks kind of started because they're out filming this snowboarding segment, backcountry using snowmobiles for access. And Dan's like, hey, watch this, hit video this, I'm going to hit this jump. And, <laughs> and he just sends it on this old... Polaris sled, and huh. it just creates this whole new segment. I can just picture right now the camera that they were using. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. V- big, big old, big old, big old, giant, old VHS. giant VHS. Yeah, and and Dan, of course, looked the same. You know, just jet black hair and jet black beard. <laughs> but yeah. That guy, that guy, I, I love him. He has looked like a forty-five-year-old since he was eighteen. <laughs> but but he still he still looks like he's he's just yeah. an icon. It, just an icon. So Dan has developed uh, uh, a big hand in developing sled necks and bringing bringing that different riding style to the forefront and and uh, backcountry safety education. I don't I don't know. There, there's a lot of people that are in that. Dan does a phenomenal job teaching sure. and teaching avalanche safety courses and all of that. And then Chris Barant, obviously. I don't know if you guys heard of Chris Barant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Doesn't he ride an M series uh, <laughs> Arctic Cat M seven? There you are with the Arctic Cat. Got to got to get your plugs in. Uh, yeah, Chris, Chris, uh, man, he's he's uh, he's also an X Games gold medalist. Then he went into the booth, the broadcast booth, and commentated on X Games. Uh, nearly won gold in Hillcross. Right, he broke a drive shot, I believe. Um, just dom- dominating that weekend. He's won Red Bull Fuel and Fury. Uh, there was a big event in Alaska that Red Bull did. Um, mm. he, he's, he's, and then he's a sled neck guy. I think he made his first appearance in three, and then he was on the cover. I can't. I don't want to say which one. Probably five or something. Five, six, seven. Um, but pioneered a lot of the backcountry techniques that we have. Wrong foot forward. Right. And, and honestly, like taught a lot of us. Like you can do crazy stuff on a snow build. Right. And, and I give him credit for pioneering the tree riding. Like taking us out of the open and sticking us in the trees. Yeah, you know Erasmuson, for sure. Uh, Brett and uh, Chris used to ride a lot together and do they, you know they did the school DVDs together, yep. you know. And I think those two really, really changed backcountry riding. Took us out of the big open hills, stuffed us in the trees. For some reason, we enjoy it. 
right? <laughs> yeah, well, and for sure it's not, I mean, that's growing up, we'd, we'd go hit a lot of big open spaces, you know, deep snow is a lot of fun and it's still fun. Um, but, you know, with the avalanche danger and trying to be a little more aware of backcountry riding, I mean, it's uh, definitely something that those guys, I, I think, turned the, the industry on its ear just a little bit with, um, I, I don't know that we hit those open areas very much anymore. So No, but, but it's interesting why, why it all happened that way. You know, I, I think a lot of people that don't know those guys and don't know that heritage right. w- would be like, well, you know, they didn't really influence that. Like, that's just where the fun is. Right. Like, well, that's not what we used to think. Yeah. You know, back when we had big bird bags and and hoods with hinges on them. Yeah. And you're you're bolting on side hill straps and thinking that was a good move. Like, yeah. It was a different riding style. Yeah. I mean, you look the way those guys pioneered that, the way they pioneered riding through those trees on those machines, they've made the machines what they are today, really. Yeah. <laughs> and those are tight, tight trees. I just remember, I remember riding it back, uh, Chris's backcountry adventure and, at the brand back country. And I, I just remember we were riding through the trees for just a few minutes and I looked down and I've got about half a tree just sitting on the top of my, my snowmobile console. I couldn't see anything. And I'm just like, these are tight, tight trees. So <laughs> there's no, I mean, they're, they're impressive for sure. Yep. Different level. So, yeah, but it, it's, it's really changed the sport. So, um, that, that will be the rest of today's show. You know, we'll, we'll switch over here and get into them in a minute. Awesome. Um, but first, uh, I do want to say thank you to, to Pure Adrenaline Motorsports. This is a new company, new gear company to the snowmobile industry. They've also jumped into motocross. Hmm. Like, it's surprising how quickly they've, they've risen to that higher level. They've, they, they, they've got pro-sponsored motocross and supercross guys. And hill climb rimshaw guys like that like their gear was all over the rimshaw circuit uh you were wearing it you wore it last year right you wore the pure adrenaline yeah one of yeah the one piece suits what what do you think of it yeah i've known i've known barry uh you know who's the founder of pure adrenaline i've, I've known him for a lot of years and uh he, he said hey you want to try some of my gear and sure enough i i tried it the uh, i i really liked it i gave him you know i gave him some of my pointers from the you know from the motor fist days some, some of the fit type uh type issues that we had and um he's gone out and you know he he actually listens to to what we have to say and he's gone out and he's changed that stuff and uh made the changes that kind of that we recommended and i think the fit's really good i stayed dry can't complain about that and but we're going into the this is this the third year it feels like the second year yeah but this is their third year third year in production <laughs> and they're 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 really big they really made a big splash like you were you were saying that that it took yeah, it took several years to get to that point, uh, at least from my perspective at Motorfist. So I'm looking at the product offering and where he's at is actually pretty impressive. I I don't know how he's gotten there so quickly, but um, it's great to have another option. I mean, competition's always good. It, it drives the industry, so yeah. well, any industry. Well, if you think, I don't know if you guys follow Moto at all, Motocross, but there's... There's like 26, 27 moto gear brands. Yeah. And it seems like we're <laughs> we're getting there on the snowmobile side of things too. You know, we, we had, for there for a while, we had like three or four big brands. Right. That kind of covered everything. And now we've got, we've got a lot of people popping up. And, and Pure Adrenaline, like I said, just make it, made a big splash. But some of the some of the gear options, like you said, they've got a full line. They've got uh, the Hero Goggle, um, which is a, a spherical shaped lens, magnetic mount. They've got a, a heated version of that, the Zone. Uh, it's a it's a two hundred fifty dollar goggle, but it's a heated goggle with that spherical lens. Nice. And man, when we were when we were in West Yellowstone, the end of February, and it was thirty three below on the yeah. way to work, and I could have used a heated glo- goggle then. Yeah, I wouldn't have turned one of those. I was wearing those magnetic ones, uh, you know, at that shoot, and they worked. They worked great. I was able to switch out my lenses, you know, quick and easy when it's you know thirty below. It's kind of nice to have something that uh, you know you can change real quick. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it's it. I, I'm kind of I'm kind of old school. I pack like three or four sets of goggles with me rather than switch my lenses. Like it's, it's weird to me to think I'm gonna pop a lens out in the snow. But like you said, that's the way to go. Yeah, it really is easier. Uh, they've got the Homer snow glove, which, uh, which put 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 your two small fingers together to keep them warmer. And uh, the gloves are new to the line this year. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah, so they they've just had gear, and and some of these goggles are new this year as well. Right. Yep. Um, on the moto side, they just released a new motocross boot. Like, like that's not easy. Right, for Throw sure. Throw that out. They've got the drop women's mono suit. Um, they're, 
what mono suit were you wearing last year? That was a good looking piece. It was the women's, wasn't it? Yeah, that was the women's yeah. suit. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> was. With this body, you, you could fit me in the women's. <laughs> yeah, and they, they've got a full line of casual wear, the chisel puff jacket. Uh, everybody loves a puff jacket in the winter. You know, it starts, starts turning chilly. You kind of live in those things for six months out here, it seems yep. like. Yeah. <laughs> like wearing a sleeping bag. Yeah, it's a good looking jacket. But yeah, thanks thanks to Pure Adrenaline. Uh, you can find out more at uh, now. What's the website? I might have to. Pam Gear. Is it Pam Gear? What? Is that? How did I? How did I not have this ready? This is just real. This is. This might be one of those edits. Oh yeah, <laughs> PamGear.com. Nice. Just yeah. remember your old girlfriend Pam, and you're good. Yeah, the old high school. All right, yeah, I'm going to have to edit here just a second. Uh, I was going to pull them up on social media. They've signed a bunch more uh, rim shot <coughs> racers this year, too. <coughs> Interesting. Is it just pure adrenaline moto? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they got their snow gear there, too. Okay, uh, yeah, you can you can see more of Pure Adrenaline Motorsports lineup at pamgear.com, P A M, pamgear.com, and Pure Adrenaline Moto on social media, at Pure Adrenaline Moto. Uh, Pure Adrenaline Motorsports. Justin and Brock, uh, thanks thanks for joining us today. We're going to jump into uh, Blair, Dan, and Chris. And, and thanks for watching. Again, tune into the Snow West YouTube channel to catch all these episodes and watch for the Snow West show on all popular podcast networks. And enjoy the rest of the show. What's up, everybody? Ryan Harris with the Snow West Podcast. Normally, I would say this, Snow, uh, this is Ryan Harris with Snow West Magazine. We still do the magazine. You can still subscribe. Don't miss an issue. We have lots of sled tests. Uh, we have our merch, too. Just hit snowwest.com. But we are getting into the podcasting stuff. Uh, Chris, man, you're, you're, you're pretty familiar with the podcasting situation here. So this is kind of where it's going. Uh, I don't know. This is our second show, so... What could go wrong, right? Well, people love to hear about snowmobiles, so yeah. that's why we're here. Well, we just want to talk. People love talking, and nobody nobody wants to like scroll through and click and read that you know too much anymore. So we've got a few cool guests here. You know, we're at Heydays. You can kind of see from the background. Uh, we've got Blair Morgan, uh, multi-time champion, uh, five-time X Game gold medals. Is yep, that right? that's right. Yep. Seven or no, thirteen? How many? How many pro snowcross titles? Do you have? I think it's like twelve. I think. 12, yeah. 15, 11. There's so many there. back in the early days. We did like three classes in a year. Yeah. So we had like a 440, 600 at open. So there's there's more than now where you can only win one. So yeah, they added up so, quick. So you got a lot. <clears throat> like let's just say yeah. a lot. Like yeah. more. Like like we're we're into double digits. And then sure. CMRC. Yeah, motocross, Canadian motocross championships. Yeah. How many of those? Five. Oh my yep. gosh. Okay, living legend right here. And then, and then we have Dan Adams. Dan is the OG. Such a setup. I don't, I don't have any of those, I don't think. I got uh, I got a silver medal in the Gravity Games in 2000. But that was what was unique about it, right? It was a first ever televised, nationally televised freestyle snowmobile event. So Quinlan won it. I got second. Cameron Elliott got third. So a lot of the OGs of Slednecks. So we kind of just created those first ever, and I just think back to the tricks and half that stuff Blair was doing while racing. <laughs> yeah. Where was that? At? So it was in Mammoth. It was in California. On yeah. trailing arm sleds? There was a ton oh of it. Gosh. Yeah. yeah. Sh Big ass seats. Yeah. Uh -huh. Bumps on the yep. back. And yep. Tail lights this big. Shad, <laughs> Shad Free was there on a red line. Like oh shit. yeah, and it was he was shifting gears, dude. Like, oh, okay. he's trying to go at these big tabletop jumps, and he's just bop, bop, bop. Like not. Oh, it was just there's wow. A lot of fun to be had. So. And then uh, we have Chris Baran. Uh, what do you, what have you done? I, I, I uh, just met you this morning. Like, I'm just a snowmobiler. Just a snowmobiler. So okay. yeah, I did a somewhat decent at X Games every now and then, and I really was terrible at snowcross, but I liked the jumps. So that's what got me into freestyle, and now uh, now I just go ride the trees every now and then. Yeah. Well, so Chris Big Air Barant, I mean, <clears throat> so you've done Red Bull Fuel, Fuel and Fury. That's kind of unique. Yep. So Red Bull Fuel and Fury was, uh, y you know, that time, that era of, uh, you know, Blair and Dan and, you know, just the timing of it was so... So awesome. I mean, freestyle motocross was kind of pushing everything, but you know, events like Fuel and Fury, where we got to go at the Paps Brewery in Milwaukee, and uh, I, you know, I won that 
really crazy event and then i remember getting on a plane a red eye to jackson to go do the hill climb and i was so like wiped and tired i was terrible at jackson that year but um and then you know freestyle x games you know being able to win that in 2007 was the catalyst for me to start brant's backcountry adventure which you know this whole movement and the way we ride now um kind of stemmed from that and so it's been a wild ride man and you know x games freestyle shows like like go through some of that too you've got, you've got a lot of medals yeah um i've got two actually i've got a gold medal in 07 and then a silver medal in uh in uh, long jump hill cross i the one the one i always regret uh that i wish i could have back was the first ever hill cross event in 2003 or something like that yeah i show up on a mountain cat but which was a ter like terrible snowmobile, but I had a big motor in it, um, and the sled was fast. And I remember, like I was a no I was a no one. Uh, everyone was picking Carl. It was Carl's event to like. I mean, they already gave him the gold before we even showed up. And Cooster and <clears throat> I show up there, and uh, you know, the first heat I win, second heat I win, and they're like, "Who is this dude?" <laughs> and um, and then I ended up uh, snapping a a drive shaft and um you know try to cobble it together to to get back in but um uh, i'm i regret that one like that one i could have won could add another medal um pretty early in my career too which would have been cool um but you know things happen for a reason and it uh, pushed me over into freestyle well and you wound up in the broadcast booth i mean you've covered how many how many x games did you yeah, I did um, at least five years of in the in the booth, which was really cool. It was a good transition, and to be able to, you know, try to tell people like, <sighs> it looks easy. You know, just when you watch athletes um, who are good at what they do, it, it makes it look easy. So to kind of give that perspective of you know what exactly is happening from an athlete perspective or someone who's actually done it is a lo is a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it adds a lot to it. <coughs> so Blair. <coughs> So when you first came down and raced, you remember the snow, West snow cross in West Yellowstone? Oh, yeah. When it was a WSA event. Mm -hmm. And you came down and you had your MX number on your sled, 734. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And gosh, man, because I, we used to flag corners because that was our, that was our event. So right. I, we'd be out there flagging corners and I grew up watching like Struthers and Hibbert and these guys and just low and, and quick, right? They got their foot hooked in the wheel well and they're just hanging it out. And they're, I mean, their eye level is underneath their handlebar. <laughs> and then this dude comes out and he's standing up and they're like, what the hell are you doing, man? Don't you know how to ride a snowmobile? And you smoke everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was the weird guy for standing up <laughs> yeah. and not abusing my back. So, <clears throat> sorry. Um, yeah, it was that was quite the life changer that event for sure. I uh, just went down, just actually Articat brought me down, and I was supposed to ride actually the semi pro class, and then I kind of watched them, and I was like, I think I can ride pro. Hey, I'm way faster <laughs> yeah. than these dudes. I got this. So yeah, just um, you know, I actually had some bad luck. Um, I only just focused on like the one class. I think 600. I, I think I broke a drive shaft or something, and. I ended up uh, winning all my heat races in the 440 um, class and then had a really good pick for the start line and uh, ended up leading the race. I think it was a 10-lap race. I think I led for like six or seven. And then uh, Kirk Hibbert passed me. And then uh, you know, I was just stoked with second. It's like a win for me. So I just followed him around to the finish. And uh, the rest is history, I guess. Yeah, I got a kind of a deal for the next year to race the whole series. and. Uh, yeah, won the first race at Duluth. Yeah, definitely just snowballed from there. So how? So before you came to that snowcross, before that all started, like, were you racing sleds? Um, sorta. Or did you just jump off a bike and you just never <clears throat> had the thought cross your mind to sit down on the seat? Well, funny story is actually, yeah, I was racing like arena crosses at the time, and I actually broke my shoulder at an event in like February, and then when I went to Yellowstone, I was kind of injured still a little bit too. So that's like. My arm was kind of bugging me in the in the final and stuff like that. So, I did like some little local races, like just for fun and stuff, but nothing too serious. And I actually wasn't a plan of mine to race snowmobiles at all. You know, I was kind of like the motocross guy, moto guy. I wanted to you know, get on a team somewhere, you know, and just be a motocross guy. And then uh, priorities shifted after Yellowstone. So where where would we be if this never happened? Yeah, it's yeah. crazy, right? Like, you ever, you ever think, Just I mean, wouldn't I, even thinking about it. Would and have then eventually look where he figured is. out to oh, like, stand up and move your feet back. <clears throat> like how long would that have taken? Well, Tucker, 
argues all the time that he would have been the guy that showed everyone the stand-up style. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's funny listening to that. You know, Kirk passes you, and um, and you know, it kind of just sets a stage for like the next. And you know, I was thinking to myself as you're saying that. Um, you know, I was. I was just a young kid just trying to figure out like, you know, when someone had asked me what you want to do, I want to, well, I want to be a professional snowmobiler. And the only way people were making money is racing. And so, um, yep. I tried racing and you know, that, that didn't work out. I, you, apparently you have to be like fairly good at it <laughs> and win to make money. Uh, um, you got to practice. Yeah. Practice and train. And yeah, that was, that was, <laughs> but what, you know, looking up to, yourself and Kirk and you know this last year I had Kirk Hibbert at my place riding at BBA and you know hearing uh, Blair talk about that you know it's just like man I'm you know riding or in this and being a part in this industry with the heroes that I grew up with you know and so it's uh it's been a wild ride um and you know we it all stemmed and started with you know Blair at West and then Slednecks in West Yellowstone too. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, we, and I think that's kind of the direction we're going to dive into right now. But, um, you know, when I saw the Slednecks two, the Y2K cover of Blair whipped upside down, I'm like, just well, unreal. Why, why are we, why are we photoshopping sleds yeah. on covers? I mean, uh, we're, we shouldn't be doing that. Fake. That's yeah. fake, way fake. That's cause that's not possible. <laughs> and, um, and then, uh, you know, watching the video and just seeing, you know, Blair go off in, uh, in that segment was pretty yeah. awesome. I, I, I would rewind that VHS tape <clears throat> probably a hundred times. Yeah. Just like, how is he doing that? I, I really don't why think he, he's off. not hitting the jump straight. Does he like, again, yeah. like, do you not know how to ride a snowmobile? <laughs> like you're yeah. in the jump cricket. <clears throat> I'm Coming the odd guy. That thing and laying that ZR sideways. Oh, insane. Yeah, it, I mean, it, you watch it to this day or even see the cover, and it's just like there's still people not doing that. I mean, it was just <laughs> epic, dude. Yeah, it like and another it's kind day of, of riding. A, a bit of a fluke, actually, too, because I kind of – actually, I, well, I'm, like, from Flatlands, Canada, Saskatchewan, so we didn't have mountains. I've never ridden mountains ever before. So then to have, like, a playground like that to be able to try things, you know, yeah. big whips and like even if you kind of like crashed it was just like powder that you landed in so it was kind of i didn't even do any of those jumps prior to 10 minutes before that photo was taken <laughs> so, so good yeah but obviously from a strong motor motorcycle background you know we did that stuff all the time but uh just yeah just learning to i guess adapt to like the the way a snowmobile feels you know it's per fairly similar to a motorcycle i think so and we always set up our sleds to be kind of more like a motocross bike. So, um, yeah, and obviously, yeah, like being in the mountains is, was new to me, and it was just the best playground ever. So it, it really did just take, like, that <coughs> photo background, not knowing much about a snowmobile, and just not yeah. not going out and snowmobiling the typical way, just you jump off a bike and jump on a snowmobile. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I, like, I, I grew up riding snowmobiles, you know, in the wintertime, and then I rode motorcycles in the summertime, so... It's not like I just showed up at Yellowstone and, like, it was new to me. Like, I honestly, like, back in the day, I used to just ride my motocross track with my snowmobile. And then back, you know, they weren't even made for that. So I'd just be breaking the thing in half all the time. And, <laughs> and it was kind of like our cross training, really, just to get ready for the summer, really. And, uh, yeah, so it's not, yeah, it's not like, yeah, I just showed up, like, just, I'll just try this sport. But I, like, literally was, like, practicing for years before that. Yeah crazy so it's the perfect segue like i mean i was a snowboarder way before i was ever riding sleds and to your point of riding motocross and then just started riding a sled the way you were you know riding your dirt bike and how you could start to manipulate the sled the way mm -hmm. you would your bike i mean that was snowboarding to snowmobiling for me i i my original 1996 polaris ultra that i bought was the first sled i ever purchased <clears throat> and in those days i mean we bought a snowmobile so that we could access the backcountry and go snowboarding and then sooner or later i just started you know, accessing terrain and even looking at terrain in the same way on a sled that I was on a snowboard. And so I took all of what I knew from snowboarding and dropping cliffs and, and the jumping and just being comfortable in the air and all of those things. And that's kind of how Sledneck started. I mean, the day that Sledneck started was a snowboarding event. Like we were filming up at Togety Mountain Lodge and we had built a huge jump as you still see people to this day still doing and using sleds for that kind of access. And so 
the the shoot was over and we'd been snowboarding and hitting this this jump the entire time and then I just came down and at that time I was on it was kind of start of sled next one so I was on a 97 700 yeah. long track 136 and long track long track and I just yeah it was before radios it was before any of it so I just yelled down to Jason Moriarty that I'm going to hit the jump and I just come down and, whoosh, and hit it and he's like oh my god dude go do that again <laughs> and I'm like you think this is nuts dude you got to come hang out with the rest of the crew here and boom, sled next was, uh, and was so started. So you're a little younger. Like we were sitting there watching Powderhound. Yeah. Remember? Yeah. Yep. And then the yeah. sled next comes out. And yeah. Like, yep. What in the world? Who is it? Who's this Cameron Elliott dude? <laughs> yeah. He didn't even know that Yamaha. Like, <laughs> that that you know, yeah. sled next one and sled next two. I mean, it 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 set the tone and the direction for my life. Like it literally did. Um, you know, I said, I want to be a sled neck. I, I saw those guys and, you know, just, I wanted to, I wanted to be that. I wanted to be a part of that. And it's just so crazy. I mean, like, you know, I had, I had no money. I was buying snowmobiles with credit cards and, um, you know, just travel. Like, so I, tr I went to West Yellowstone to the, to the expo, um, because that used to be the, that used to be like what Jackson is now. Yeah. yeah. You know, that and, was the show. And, you know, unfortunately it's kind of faded away a little bit, but it was whatever I could do to get up there. And I, I heard that Slednex was going to be there. Yeah. And, um, and so I ended up just, you know, bumping into the right person. Uh, and then, and, and actually, you know what it was, it's how I got my, my nickname, oh, Big, yeah. Big Air. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah so that, that's where I met you is at the, the Big Air show that, at West. Yep. That's right. And yeah. So, uh, you know, the, the contest was there was three tricks, you know, you got to do three tricks. And well, I only had two, you know, I had Blair Superman that I took from him. <laughs> and then I had this sick can can where I barely got my feet over the, the seat and then back. And then I'm like, man, I don't know what I'm going to do for the third one. I'm like, I'm just going to send it. That's what I'm going to do. And, um, so, you know, literally like, you know, come around and start in, the next state and come over and just i hit it and missed i mean i yeah. literally landed out in the flat hood flies off yeah. windshield flies off and, and remember it wasn't a ramp right we just took the finish line and yes, like yeah. 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 i remember, I remember just, that we yeah. just made the jump and then there's chris like out in the shadows like lands <laughs> yeah. so far out on the deck that his hood rips off and the whole deal and the crowd goes bananas i remember that, that was remember that. that's big i was there brand. watching that yeah, yeah you are yeah. like twice as far as like the landing it <laughs> yeah. could have been another tabletop and then you would have landed that heath frisbee was there he had blue hair he was in a he was on a like a 136 mountain sled He was about this big just cocky as all get out it was awesome and yeah. and and you know is literally after that jason moriarty from Slednex. he l comes up to me he's like hey you're coming with us tomorrow i'm like you got it. There it yeah, is. Yep, yep. Check that box. Yep. Deck. Yep. Yep. So, and that's your, at, your I mean, interview went well. You did. Yeah. He's yep. like that dude goes huge. Yes. And you then sled next material. What was funny about that day is, unfortunately, you weren't you weren't there. I, I never got to I never got to ride with Blair, but Tucker. So Tucker was there, and I was. I mean, literally. I, I, you know, I couldn't sleep that night. I was so amped. I mean, it was so annoying, probably. Like, I'm like, I'll hit that, hit that. Guys, get ready. I'm going to hit this. And, like, I think I can grab the bumper, the rear bumper, and I'll come back to the sled. And so I'm trying to, like, literally do a bumper grab. Sick. Like, just die. I mean, just <clears throat> wadding myself everywhere. Tucker's like, who is this idiot? Because I'm, like, stealing the show, you <laughs> know. And Tucker's just sitting there like, can I try anything? No. You sit over there. I'm, this is me. <laughs> and so what we wouldn't give for these airbags that we watched yesterday we're like i mean you got to be looking at that stuff too we're just yeah. like these guys can just epically fail and they just land on a sleep number bed it's just incredible and it's revolutionized the sport i mean it's made shows a lot safer and everything else and chris and i just we just happen to be watching together and these guys are just landing all cushy but it's it increased that. the number of, of athletes that are participating in the sport <laughs> yeah where before you know yeah only the guys with big balls were doing it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a different sport, different different era now with that. Yeah. So what would you say is your defining moment in sled decks? Because I've got one in mind. The, like, okay, that's that dude's going to be something. Well, I'll, t I'll tell you, when I saw Jim Rippey do his the flip on an 01 700 trailing arm sled, when I saw that, I was like, 
Well, it was funny that year. I thought I got the cover because I had I had this really cool. Like, well, it was the year I jumped over the cabin. I jumped over a house, um, which yep. you know, Garth totally compound fractured his leg, and I'm 100 feet up in the air on this like clapped out 440, and I'm like, man, I'm gonna get the cover of Slednecks, and then Jim Rippy goes and does the first, you know, yeah. backflip. So I thought that was a that was for me that was a pretty defining <clears throat> moment like we're this is this is happening like at a very fast pace i thought just i thought jumping a house was going to be cool but a backflip was cooler so dan what were you thinking i mean you were in the first one you were there right off the bat with yep. cameron and jason and getting this thing going and yeah we, we honestly the crew. yeah i mean it's just it's to, to think back on it now and to know that we started that thing in like the spring of 97 and Slenix comes out that, you know, that, that next, well, in the fall, and, and we had, like, two weeks of footage, potentially. I mean, we just really, I mean, it's why Slenix is kind of part a bunch of crazy moto stuff, and, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that we just used as, like, fill-in, and then there's the Riverton crew and everything else. We didn't really know what we were about to do. I mean, we just were all having fun. It wasn't really about anything but just going and using sleds and having fun, and we were just chasing moto guys, to Chris's point, was, like, freestyle was going on, and it was, like, the Seth Enslows and the dudes that were just going huge. And we were just emulating basically that. I mean, if you think about the, the tricks and just the stuff, I mean, we didn't even start seeing sleds, you know, start to get sideways and do all that stuff. And that was all thanks to Blair. Like we didn't see any of that. Everything we were doing was just going big. Hucking. I mean, part of what I've continually told people is like, you know, I, I would swear to you that the only reason I even had a sled back in those days was to see how far I could huck the thing down the mountain. Yeah. We didn't side hill. There was no opposite foot forward. There's no, there wasn't any of that stuff. And so, I mean, defining moment for me of any of it was just, I mean, literally from the get go, just realizing what this whole thing was going to end up becoming. And it's a, it's a shame that, I mean, Slednex is, is kind of there, it's got an Instagram, it's kind of there, it's kind of not, and how many people, anytime he kind of pokes his head out of wanting to do something, you can see how many believers in it. They're like, God, it's got to come back, keep doing it. It was just such a cool thing. They miss that, you know, what what that was and what we created there. Um, Like, to your point, too, the backflip, I mean, I ended up becoming the the ninth guy in the world in 2005 and backflipping off of that on a M6 141, and I went back to the same exact place. same spot same that Rippy did same, his. Same hit. And then and I did the year after and wadded myself. <laughs> but <laughs> I got I got pretty lucky. I, I utilized the, you know, the sports that I was familiar with, and John Layshock was the photographer that luckily got some of that. Otherwise, it was basically one shot from the back, and it was because no one, including myself, was going there that day to go backflip a snowmobile. I mean, Courtney Hungerford and Lee Stewart were backflipping 50, like, mini bikes in the OGO, like, foam pit. And back in those days, like, a foam pit was a big deal to have something like that. And so those guys, because of competition and things like that, they were really preparing themselves to be able to flip. And I watched Courtney Hungerford flip a sled right in front of me, little 440 race sled. And he... He did it so with so little speed that as he came around, his ski loops actually touched the snow before he landed. Like it was so close to just being a complete <sighs> endo. And he lands and he's so surprised that it happened that his hands get ripped from the bars, but his feet are so rammed into the toe loops that he like stays on, but he <laughs> like flexes back and he still kind of does it. And I'm just from me to that trailer away, you know, and I'm like, holy cow, I just watched this happen. And. So I keep trying to like, I'm always been a coach. I was a coach with snowboarding. I've always been like where I see what happens and I'm just analyzing it. And even though I've never done it, I'm just trying to give Lee all the pointers that I just saw. And then something just clicked in my head. I'm like, there's never going to be a better time than right now to just put this thing together. And so I just went up and sized up that runway. And it was just this, I think about what these guys are flipping now. Heck, I think about, you know, talk about lives in parallel when Brant won X Games. I was a judge. And so I'm sitting up in the box looking at this insane comp ramp to just death down off this step down. And I'm saying it to Kirk <coughs> Zach and the rest of the judges, like, the guy that backflips this step down is going to win gold at X Games. And this crazy son of a bee that had learned to backflip like 48 hours earlier <laughs> just sizes up. And you can see it. I could see it in his elbows. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm getting the chills right now. I'm like, he's yeah, doing yeah. it. I'm like, he's doing it. He's doing it. He's doing it. And, ugh, dude, gnarliest thing I've ever seen because you could literally see your reflection in that snow. And this crazy sucker just so rightfully earned, 
in 2007 winning that thing and it was cool to be in the box and help make that happen it was awesome but my story i'm like staring at this huge wall of snow just like rippy was and i like i said i just seen courtney do it and i'm going yeah this is it i think i got one move here and it's wide open throttle and pull back lean back and i'm going through the motions and i just talked about this in a podcast i did with five and nine you're gonna think this is funny like right then i'm like thinking about my insurance <laughs> i was like thinking about like what Irina and we weren't married at the time but i'm like thinking about what she's gonna think and like oh my god if i destroy this sled and just all the things right i mean this was way before the yeah. the whole programs that all really even kind of come to play you well, know yeah, it's all coming out of your pocket everything's like, out of pocket free jacket yeah and i'm just like all right despite what could happen to me at this point i'm like if i wad this sled she is gonna be you know what i mean i'm just going through all this stuff and then lay shock is up on the deck and he's like dude just pretend you're wakeboarding. He's like, this is nothing, another flip from wake to wake on a wakeboard. And I don't know why that just, I mean, I'm hanging onto those handlebars and I'm just like, you know what? He's totally right. Get out of your own head. And Clayton staff starts like filming the clouds. He's not even paying any attention to me. And all of a sudden he hears the sled move and you just see him whoop and he sets up. So it's from behind and he just, he's like, are you doing this? And I'm just boom right there and just straight up and down. And anyway, it's, I coach now. I mean, what I do in the wintertime is just telling everybody, you know, have confidence, eyes up, all these things. And you watch me from that footage and from the photos especially because it's from the side. And you see me give up. Like, I go into this, like, this is a fantastic idea. And then as I hit the lip, I'm like, this was the dumbest thing I've <laughs> ever done. Because you watch me go from <clears throat> full commit to now I'm looking straight at the hood of my sled. So I'm up above the streetlights <laughs> looking at my snowmobile. And Blair Man, that still works for me to this day, he had this custom airbrushed skull on the hood of that M6. And I'm just looking at that like it's like a reflection of me that I am toast at this point. Uh -huh. But I'm so freaking high and I'm just wide open throttle, just gripped to the snowmobile. I remember talking to Chris how when he was trying it, he was, your feet were coming away from the boards. Yeah. And I was so freaked out, dude. You couldn't have pawed me off of that thing. I was a, a koala bear on a branch. <laughs> like I was locked into this thing. But out of the peripheral, out of the side of my eye, like I look over and I see Layshock just getting it, just taking the picks, and I realize high, how high I still am. And I'm like, oh, dude, I got this. So those kind of nanoseconds of regret and that I'm not doing this, and then it's like, oh, I got this, and just arched out and just first time I ever tried it, man. So I got to put one of the tricks that I know cost a lot of people a lot of pain, a lot of snowmobiles, a lot of issues. I got to put that little you know, trophy or whatever you want to call it and just put it on the shelf. Well, and the way, the way Stassert caught it is cool because it, you know, normally you go out there and you're like, okay, you got to be there. You got to have a camera there. Like, this is how you're going to hit it. Yeah. And for him to just be like, oh, Dan's going. <laughs> it was cool. It, yeah. It just gave it that <coughs> feel. Yeah. And of, then of what sled next is, is just like, I see that I'm going to hit it. Yeah. 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 And my interview with Clayton, he's like, so did you think you were going to backflip a snowbill today? And I'm just, it was just, it was cool. It was a, that was a fun, fun, fun moment to just know that that was possible. And to think there was that many guys, even at that time in 2005, I mean, I kind of made the top 10 or if you will, but it was like, there was that many dudes that were doing it and then starting to turn it into guys doing it in competition. And now it's like, it's just like the moto world. Like, you know, you don't come to a freestyle show and if you don't have a backflip, I mean, I don't know why you'd enter. You know, you got to have something. I mean, we just watched the double yesterday yeah. on, on a bike. We're just You're standing there at random and just guy double flipped a mount, uh, dirt bike. You're just like, it's just, it's just the level. Normal, everyday normal. thing now. Just yeah. the level is it's just. Crazy. It progresses so fast because getting over that hump initially was just so hard. Like you said, like like the first two or three, four or five guys that do it. Yeah. And then. I think it was, you know, talking, hearing that story and then just thinking about what was going on in the industry. And I, I wanted to ask Blair this. So, you know, Blair, like you were, you know, at that time, X Games was just this pinnacle, right? I mean, everything that you guys did. Yeah. I mean, you had the circuit and you, you it was fun watching you and, and Tucker battle and, and, but everything always came boiled down to X Games. Oh, yeah. And, and the courses were phenomenal and just, it was magic, right? It was so cool to watch. What did you think, like, when you see this, this whole revolution of, uh, of our sport really coming, coming to the forefront of, like, you know, backflips and freestyle and, and uh, you know, snowcross and all that? What, I mean, you were, because, you know, that's what I always looked up to you. You weren't just a snowcross racer. You know, you're out here hucking jumps and then you're winning motocross and, and all of that stuff. So, like, what, what did you think was going on at that time? Well, like, 
we said that first race in Yellowstone, um, I think Snowcross was just on its way up and obviously, uh, you know, it started being on like ESPN and stuff like that. And then I think that's how it got kind of into the X Games and that. And yeah, you're right. Like the X Games was the, the event for the year. Like, I think even like the manufacturers are like, like sure, the, the, the national circuit's cool, but that is the event that you want to win. So um, <clears throat> just... Uh, it's kind of funny, like you say, like the freestyle stuff and like doing like the first sled next and that, like the, well, it, it, Arctic Cat at the time I was riding for, like they didn't want me to do that stuff. They're like, don't do it. And <laughs> you've probably seen that too. Like yeah. they didn't want to sponsor probably anybody, right? Like, oh, these sleds are not made for that. And yep. so no, we, they, got that. we got that. A yeah, bit. exactly. And then yeah. they kind of got actually angry at me a little bit for like even doing like the sled next stuff. And even like my manager was like, uh, asking like Jason Moriarty because I, I hit that one video I hit that tree you know yeah. and we're like are you paying for all this damage <laughs> so yeah I went from pretty quickly to see like how exciting and how it kind of elevated all the snowmobiling and getting probably younger youth into involved that went from like oh we don't really want to support that to like we're fully supporting that right so it was kind of cool to see that transition and that's the way you know it was like like when I came with the stand up style like the old style of like sitting down and doing like cross country racing and and stuff that wasn't that exciting really yeah. to make it making it exciting i think that's what changed everything yeah well i think it's interesting you know you look at a sport that was getting a little hmm, like you said we'll just, we'll just call it boring yeah right? like, exactly uh, and then it completely changes with you know with the stand-up riding yeah, style a little and, more aggression and, and, yeah, and, and, and what you guys did and it's no different than what mountain riding did for us you know in 2005 with the m7 yeah it was it went from like mm -hmm. if i have to build another sled to high mark something I, i'm gonna i'm just this is like not it's getting boring you know and then we started like doing all these crazy things of side hilling and going in the trees and like yeah. it just it changed the sport forever that yeah, chassis you, really you guys, changed a you guys lot mainstreamed backcountry riding like you eliminated high marking and just turned it into like terrain. Like, Which is pretty awesome. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah. I had, uh, keep going. I had a thought with you, but I. Well, I was just going to say, and at the same time, you know, besides sled necks, then you see like two stroke cold smoke and then pe people were catching on. So then it was just becoming, you know, lots of stuff happening up in Canada. And there was just, it, it, it just snowballed, right? I mean, it really did start to like open up doors of guys that were, well, potentially already doing that. They just weren't ever putting it on screen. You know, this wasn't. The yeah. days of social media where we just we think about what it is now to a lot of the youth you know if you think about kids that are you know we're our age that we just didn't have that i mean chris and i talk about it all the time that's like the anticipation of a cover of snow esther sledheads magazine was just that's what we had to go on you know that's what we were excited about is yeah. like dude i think i'm gonna have a killer segment i can't wait to see it you yeah know, you wouldn't see it moriarty For a month just, or two moriarty yeah. just <laughs> hold out on you until it was nearly ready and then they'd you know you'd pop in and get the segment or whatever who was going to get the cover and yeah. just all those things and i mean snow west magazine you guys were you guys had so much to do with this success as well because you guys i mean you're the ones out there you'll remember the ride we did in jackson where you know i fell off that snow bridge and i'm laying underwater and brant's got to walk out there and remember we yeah. laid my wheels and that cat like down on the ground yeah. and him and i are in the creek trying to fix the thing and you're yeah. up there taking pictures oh, yeah. and all my gloves are soaked and i do the rest of that ride with no gloves and we just had so much dang fun it was man. a lot of fun i, I miss those days and I, and I miss being able to do sledheads magazine because that was just so the sledheads magazine was from what the industry had. yeah was th that was so forward thinking and and like just that it, it really helped put us on the map like when it it yeah. described what was going on yeah and not just f from a corporate side snow west is was a corporate magazine Sledheads was like a sled next magazine it was you know what sure. I mean? it's exactly what it was yeah. supposed to be and we got yeah. to showcase the builds i mean you think yeah. about how long ago where you'd be like let's do the full spread of these builds with nitrous and custom painted hoods and just oh, all yeah. this stuff yeah. and we I mean, it's so funny. We're still doing it today, right? It's just in a different way. But yeah. I mean, it's that, that that's what Sledheads Magazine was able to help us do from so many years ago. I'm yeah. curious, Ryan, you said that you had an idea of what kind of defined Slednecks um, or that you defining know, that, moment, that, yeah. a defining moment. What For you? Yeah. Uh, when you when you came off that hit the drop, tree, hit the tree. Yeah. I loved that. Oh, yeah. dude. That blew, I mean. Uh, yeah, it just blew yeah. my mind. Everyone knows and that. The, and the, and sure. the commentating of Quinlan, like, he's hitting that tree. 
<laughs> like you just see the run and he's just calling it out. He's hitting the tree and then he hits the tree and it's like before he's even seeing if this guy's okay, he's like, I knew it. I, <laughs> I like told he, you. He's so excited about the fact that he called it out. I'm like, is he all right? Because that was unreal. Yeah. yeah, that was wild. Man, I miss Quinlan too. Like, yeah. like that's, that's one dude I wish would start coming to show. Dude, he pranked called me. This was years ago, but he prank calls me, and I can just tell his voice, right? I just remember it's very distinctual. And he he calls me, and he's just like, "Yeah, I'm uh," he's like, "I'm up here in Anchorage, and I'm 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 looking into a riding clinic." And he just goes down. And he's totally serious, and he's like, "So I just I'm trying to get some pricing." And he's like, "I've been on your website and everything else, and I I kind of think that I know who I'm talking about, but I'm kind of letting it run too, and I'm just going through it, and then." He kind of bobbles and says something, and then we start laughing. I'm like, "What's up, Jay?" Yeah. And it was so fun. But we, I mean, after so many years and getting to hear that he, you know, I mean, injury is kind of what pulled him from a lot of this stuff. The guy was just, I mean, there's never going to be another Jay. No. Well, my, my 16 year old daughter, Quinn. We named her after Jay Quinlan. That is we were gonna name so. Her Quinlan. That is wow. so we, cool. She cut it down to Quinn. And That's a cool name. I like oh, it. Man. Yeah, he he. He, he will always have a place in this in terms of just... I just wish you would come to the show. Like, mm-hmm. like people want to see you. Like, like yeah, well, there's your... too clean and proper now, I think. Yeah, yeah. There's <laughs> your... Uh, there's a little corporate up there, but... Yeah. yeah. So there's your next, like, podcast blast from the past to hear somebody like that. Because he literally, he just kind of, you know, went away. I mean, he just jumped when from this OJ'd whole thing. When he OJ'd that ski lift... Oh, I mean, that hurt just watching it. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. Well, just that. All, all of, I yeah. mean, every single stunt that he did was just like, yeah. yikes. When I broke my back at that freestyle event in Jackson, I mean, I was so high and nowhere near my snowmobile as I was about to really injure myself. And I could, I was so high, I could remember watching Chris, like, running to where I was going to land. I mean, Quinlan did that over the ski lift and, like, walked away from that thing. The dude was just... Yeah. I don't know, man. Slams. Just nothing but cartilage or just tougher than I've been. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, he he penetrated into like a couple of feet of like groomed yeah, trail groomed and just gets up and he's That's just one of the okay. Big, one of the big jumps that I remember is that one. Dude. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. About like what mine was. Just such a misjudge. Like, yeah. hits that thing and where the bowl wheel is is like kind of where he's supposed to be coming down and he is still going up. <sighs> like, it was unreal. Yeah, that was the Seth Ensel moment. For yeah. Me. Yep. Like, yeah. That was like, okay, we've hit that one. All right. We're just kind of going parallel with the motor world. Yeah. Yeah. But that one was insane. I can remember riding for Fox the head and having Fox like moto gear. We were riding sleds. And I can remember being on the phone with my sort of athlete manager from Fox as Seth Enslow overjumped that jump where he was like, he was going for a record and it was like between two like light poles and the guy on the phone, his name was Jason and he's like, dude, I have to go. And you could hear the bike and then it was in a film later, but he was like, that was like a live thing while he's on the phone with me and he's like, dude, Seth just overjumped. I got to go. And he just hangs up on me. And to see that from later, I think we all know what I'm talking Like Seth overjumped a jump. Like he wasn't even near the landing Yeah. and just decked way out there. So the bike broke. Oh, the bike God, broke. Dude. Yeah. The forks broke. broke yep. uh, yeah. Broke every, I mean, so gnarly, dude. Yeah. That's crazy. So. Um, are you happy with where the sport is now? Like snowcross in particular, because it seems like it, it peaked and you know, you brought rhythm to the sport and you guys brought, brought rhythm to backcountry. It was, we were all just bashing moguls there before that. Yeah. But the, you know, you talk about the, the X games track, the snowcross track, that thing was enormous. It was a monster. Mm-hmm. And then that's yeah. gone away. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It kind of, I think, yeah, for sure. X games tracks suffered after like we, we had like the big big downhill doubles and stuff like that and then it kind of got a little more tamed out i think um same with a lot of the racing i think with the national series and and then just i think technology in the sleds now um you know we obviously had the shore we had we have a couple revs out there with the 121s and then now we race 136s so it just the tracks develop differently now where we we're really like smooth and try to double in and holes and pop out and that and we're now the sleds work so well they can just like pound through it like a whoop section just like bing 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 bang so it doesn't look as smooth but they're definitely going way faster than what we did for sure yeah so what what was it like when you jumped onto that rev when you left cat you go to skidoo you get on that rev what was that transition like yeah we've because actually been now, didn't they they build that sled this is the blair morgan sled yeah well we've actually been talking about a lot about that um this weekend because it's 20 years now when the rev came out and uh you know i really I was still with Articat at the time when that thing came out and then they showed me that sled 
and um, wanted me to race it. So to see, yeah, to see that thing compared to what the sledge used to look like, yeah, I was sold for sure. I was like, yeah, I'm racing that next year. I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm changing brands here. So, um, yeah, it, it was like, well, it's called the Rev because it's revolutionary, and that's definitely what it did. It, it uh, changed everything, you know, especially like a stand-up t- uh, type of riding style. Like, it just felt comfortable and... Um, yeah, compared like the racing before was, um, you know, it was b- kind of boring, really. Like yeah. what Chris said, like it was like everyone's sitting down, kind of doing the same thing for years and years, and then to change it up and be kind of bringing it to that next level. Um, you know, the sleds now and the riders, everything just uh, elevated. It was kind of like that next step. Yeah. And and how funny is it that that exact same style of riding is what really changed hill climbing too. You know, I wasn't ever much of a hill climber. I kind of tried my hand at that game. Went to Jackson, ran out of gas one time, <laughs> nearly killed a photographer or another. Like, just knew that, you know, I think we'd Sounds always... Sounds like my attempt. Yeah, <laughs> just, just, I always tell people there's just not enough trees in the way or something. I just, anyway, leave it up to the pros. But you remember that time frame. And as a kid, I mean, I've been going to the hill climbs for a long, long time now. And to see Rick Ward and see some of these older guys where they kept sitting down and they'd, they'd go up that thing in just a totally like poised different position and still posting really fast times. And now you got the Keith Curtis's, the Andy Thomas's, the Luke Rainey's and these dudes that are basically taking a ton of what they've adapted as a backcountry riding style, standing up opposite foot forward and just like what these guys are able to do, right? On, on edge, on gate. Yes. Yeah. And, and you remember that that never happened. It was always, you know, you know, butt to the seat and like, you know, real wide ski stance and just, I mean, especially in the open mods and some of that stuff. I mean, look at what's happened to the snowmobiles too. You know, they're way tamed down. I mean, you wouldn't really notice the difference between Keith or Andy's backcountry sled to their like open mod race sled. And that was never the case back in the day with hill climb sleds. They were, I mean, they were like six feet wide. It looked like, I mean, the guys were going up that thing. I remember Brett Rasmussen and some of these dudes, they'd come up with no hood and triple pipes and you were it was like the hill crew was just running yeah. <laughs> just like get, get out of this guy's way this guy with wranglers and a boat buckles coming up at a thousand miles an hour oh yeah yeah that was uh that was the old style and then now the new style you know big they thought big motors and big everything and yeah. just, they just i think prayed when they went they up. just yeah, yeah. and it wasn't any like and technique it was when, yeah and it was when the mountain would win all the time you know, that a high mark would be a, a, like a win of a class. And occasionally we still get that. But, I mean, you think about it now and it's down to the, you know, the hundredth of a I mean, these guys are just as, I mean, the, the level of competition. And as the snowmobile riding style changed, you know, obviously so did technology within the snowmobiles. And now they look at mountains like, well, the Jackson Hill Hill Climb. And using this last year as a killer example, I mean, you think about how much they're having to make it technical with all the turns because... I mean, back in the day when it was kind of straight up and down, like where yeah. the catch net would be. And like they're, they, you remember that they'd duck into the, like the, the trough where the catch net would be. And then it was straight to the top and it was just a straight up hill climb and dudes were still not making it. Hmm. And now it's like, if they don't make it technical, I mean, it'll be a 30 second run to the top of Jackson Hole. I mean, they Every, got to, everybody they, will get, they got to make it as technical as they can. So the more turns and logs and stumps and everything else. And it's just crazy to watch the level of riding. And then obviously the, the technology and as it's improved, I mean, it's just made everything bigger, better, faster, lighter. Yeah. It's just all. That's what I've seen, like watching videos of Chris and, you know, just the, the riding technique and then the technology, the sleds, like the where you guys can get now is insane. Yeah. Brent's been a, an innovator for the longest freaking time. I mean, he's basically the, you know, created the hop, created the, whether it was on purpose or not, which is always <laughs> how to get through. Well, some of the most you know, you need to go ride in Brant's terrain. Like yeah. he's, he's in an environment that has forced him to be as good as he is in Colorado is between its snow, between the steepness, the trees, how tight some of that stuff is. And he's got something for everybody there. Don't get me wrong, but there are zones that like mm-hmm. they'll hand you. I mean, there yeah. it's, it's a very humbling, it's literally a life or death situation. <laughs> it is very humbling to ride with Chris and where he feels very calm and collected and just sort of his natural terrain versus even my terrain like it's it's awesome yeah, there's no level spot to like sit and chill out with. <laughs> no Let's it's see. tough finding lunch spots <laughs> yeah you know yeah, yeah i see that i'll like you're parked on like the edge oh, you yeah, always all, like that all the time yeah yep. <laughs> i'm always saying every winter that i wished i had more time to get down and and do more of this i mean the first time you and i really rode with no cameras no attention to any of this stuff no action action no none of that was in chile together yeah. and 
I can tell how much fun I'd end up having if you and I could spend more time on the snow and following him and vice versa. It's it's actually way more of a, a like a stressful situation to have him following you. Like it's one thing to like try to chase his lines up the hill, but when I know he's right behind me, that's a whole nother level of I got to be on my game there's, there's and some anxiety. That, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it's and it's and it's a state uh, that I absolutely love because you get pretty dang complacent with your riding. Obviously, with what both of us do, we teach people that are trying to get to that level. So you spend a ton of your winters riding with people that you're, you know got to get over on this side and bend your knees and oh don't remember you know don't forget to put that finger on the brake and there's just a ton of it that I mean that's why we have jobs that's why we're doing what we're doing but when we get to go out and he's not telling me and I'm not telling him it's just a level of just let's go see what these things can do and what we can do and that's a that's a ton of fun it yeah really is yeah and 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 this group right yeah like you know, we wanted to talk about 90s snowmobiling and sledneck's, but you three also, you know, we talked about your impact on the sport, change the sport, your impact on the sport, change the sport, your impact on the sport. I don't think people realize the way that mountain sleds are ridden now are, are because, like you said, of the crap you rode in Colorado. The way you ride, the way you get around trees, the way you change the directions, that's impacted the sport all across the mountain. You know, I think what's unique about all of that, all three of us here is, and this is why freestyle had, didn't have any legs for me for a career path was because what Blair was doing, what Dan and I were doing was relatable to more of the general public, right? Like, People could relate to watching me go ride through the trees like, huh, that's not a death-defying backflip over the Grand Canyon. Mm -hmm. I can, I think, I mean, that that was interesting to them. It was an interest to them. It's no different than your riding style. Like, huh, he literally just stood up and it looks a lot more fun to ride. Maybe I can do that. And I think, you know, that that is what ended up being the big push was just an aha moment from all, you know, the, the general public of just saying, hmm, that's something that looks really fun. And, and it was. Well, what I, think you, what I think you brought to the sport, and this goes back to the first time we rode together at Snowshoot, Articat brought you up. Yep. Which was probably a mistake. <laughs> but they did make you ride your own sled. No, 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 no. no. It, was the, it was, you were on that black, it was the fighter jet themed m mm -hmm. okay is that six, yeah seven eight nine it was well it was probably it had to be i guess it was we were grand lake yep and we were was it grand lake yeah oh, yeah it was grand lake grand lake and we're all sitting there and this this is where it, like you said the aha moment it just clicked it's like okay this is where the sport's going because mm -hmm. we can we're all sitting there out in this open spot like gathering up to go to the next spot to shoot and we're like, where the hell's Chris? And we can hear Chris, this cluster of trees over here 100 yards away. And we're like, what's he doing in there? It's like, he can't get through there. He, what's he doing in there? How's he going to get out? He's screwed. And then all of a sudden you just hear, Wah! and this black Arctic cat just pops out of these trees and branches go everywhere. And he just rolls up and he's like, what's up, guys? What's up? <laughs> I'm just going to tell you that that hasn't changed. <laughs> no. The, the idea of we're all over radios. Uh, of where's Chris and then you just hear and see you know something up there that you're like yeah that's not supposed to you're not supposed to be there but, but and he's just comfortable yeah, as I'll get out we used to ride playground to playground yeah. around trees and then you turned into oh the fun is in, in the, the, trees. the trees yeah, yeah. and then everybody shifts yeah, yeah. It yep. was it was so and and again you know I guess it's why it's what has kept the passion so relevant for me year after year after year is because it isn't just going to this one little open playground open pl playground and again boring right we, we uh, it's there is no shortage of action and no shortage of, i mean you'll just never win you can never beat the the mountain now because it's it's harder than what you can do and i love I, you know i love that part of it i love that challenge mm -hmm. and it's well and I don't know if it was intentional, but it kind of tied into the safety stuff. It took people out of high mark. Oh, man. It, it got you off the exposed slope and put yeah. you in a little bit safer terrain. Yeah. I had been in, a, like, several avalanches. and Bad one. Yeah. 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 Like quite a few of them. Yeah. And it was – and it just stinks. I look back. I'm like, man, I was so complacent about it. Like, really bad. And so thankful to kind of get through that that area uh, of my life but it's I mean for sure like it wasn't intentional but it was it was definitely something that was a good transition for for everybody 
Yeah. But now, now what's happening is, you know, the machines are so good and the riders are getting so good is that we can, we are getting into this avalanche terrain, like, you know, above trees or like around trees. And yeah. And, and you're, you've, you've taken the caliber of rider and dropped down a few steps and then you're putting that guy in that terrain. Yeah. Yep. So. Um, we've taken up a lot of your time, 50 minutes onto this thing. So great stories though. Appreciate you guys <laughs> taking the time. This is what I want to do more of. Like this is the kind of podcast that, that we're going after. In fact, this, this will be the Sledhead show. Yeah. And that cool. ran back and, and bringing all that. Very cool. Um, but yeah, thanks for the time, man. Yeah. It's, it's no been, problem. it's been fun just chatting with you guys. Heck, we only do- dove into like, you know, that yeah, much. I know. Yeah. There's so I know. much that's to the, talk that's about. Really? We, yeah. we could get together again and just keep jumping in. I mean, there's, you got, you got like one ride, yeah. one day that you could talk about for an hour. I didn't even get to the story. Uh, uh, I'm going to, I'll make this quick. And Blair, I don't know if you remember this. Oh yeah. He we, told me this we were, we were a little tuned up. We were at, we were in, in Aspen at X Games and this was like, I look back at this. I'm like, man, I got so lucky. So I I was working for Articat at the time. I was um, I was a, a DSM. I was a district sales manager, and so I no 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 sorry. I was doing the M7 tour. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had the big black corporate dually said Articat Beef River Falls right on the side of the door. And one night after X Games, we got a little we were having fun. Okay, that's I'll say that. And there's like. 13 people piled into the dually and like, you know, it's night in Aspen and cops are running around and everything and we're rolling down the street and we look over and I'm like, hey, there's Blair Morgan. Hey, Blair. And Blair's just like, and I don't know, you (laughs) must have been having a good time too because you literally jumped into the back seat like crowd surfing on top (laughs) of all the people and then we're just rolling around in Aspen with, uh, you know, Blair Morgan in the back seat on top of all my friends. And so it was always a good time. It was always a good time. Yeah. 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 Especially if you did well. We, we we have to ask, too, uh, do we still have the Acura? Do you no. still have the NSX? No, I wish I did because of the value in those things are going up. Yeah. 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 Years later. Yeah. We're, we're, we we like cars. We like fast cars. And yeah. we'll just never forget you having You're that like, thing. It's like, oh, it's like, what a waste of money, right? And then... It's like it appreciates in value, right? It just so, becomes this thing that yeah. you wouldn't have known. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're kind of young and just really. It's just I, I guess it's kind of a goal to achieve to, you know, have like a dream car that you liked and yeah. yeah. So I'm I'm glad I did it and like, I'm glad I you know kind of wasted money on that. <laughs> so but <laughs> sometimes no, sometimes yes. But yeah, I, I'm I'm glad you know even though my manager and stuff didn't like it, but. We um, all liked it from we, uh, from we, the outside. We really yeah. did. Yeah, it's kind of yeah. like seeing somebody achieve a goal of like you know, and then kind of making it in the sport. It's, it's always glad to That's see right. somebody do that. Yeah. Well, I am certainly proud of both of you guys. You guys have been leaders. It's been fun watching you and, and learning from you. And you certainly did change the game for a lot of people. This guy, I can't say it enough. I mean, just from watching him grow up, and you know, he came into Slednex Slednex three three. It was about yeah. that time frame, right? And just coming in, just. <laughs> Big Air Barant, man. I'm. I want to go as big as Seth. I mean, remember all those things like riding a bullet bike, and oh, I mean, man. there's just so many things that this cat has done. And Chris and I have known each other for a long, long time, and it's just cool to see careers rolling in parallel. I mean, we we talk so differently than we used to back in the day, and it's it's a lot of fun to just see us still. We're camping together here, and we're still rolling around doing all this stuff this many years later, and it's taken a ton of work. That's all I tell anybody. I mean, if anybody's out there just trying to understand, like, how careers get built and, and how we're sitting here with you, Ryan, and everything else, and same with you. It was just, it's all just a ton of work. It's just work. We just, that, that's, I mean, that, that's what I want to tell, man, because people just want it now. It's like, yeah. how, how, oh, do, yeah. I get, how yeah. do I get factory sponsors yeah, like, is, tomorrow? Yeah. 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 It's yeah. not, it doesn't happen yeah. overnight. No. You guys have got a lifetime in this. Yeah. 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 yeah, like you said, like, bless you also, my first race, like, it, it seemed like I just, like, showed up and won, or got second behind Kirk Hibbert, but, yeah, like, years and years of training and i think that was kind of my thing that changed the sport a little bit too is where all the other racers like saturday night they're they're in the bar <laughs> and uh and i was like i bet early eating good and training and stuff like that and i i think that changed the whole story it's kind of oh, like yeah, ricky, Car- 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 ricky Car- carmichael did yeah, yeah. yeah. so that's kind of it took it to the next level taking it a little more serious also you know just being very serious with yeah, uh treating it treating it yeah so <laughs> treating it like a career, really, yeah. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I had uh, I had a guy uh, a couple of weeks ago. I was hanging out with Andy Thomas, and it was over Fourth of July. I guess it's not more than a couple of weeks ago, but um, 
the guy was like, so is this your son? <laughs> so he's sitting with Andy Thomas. And so I don't know if that's a complete call out to just how, where I am in this industry. And it was pretty awesome. And I just looked at him and looked at Andy and I'm like, you know what? If I could call that kid my son, I'd be pretty damn proud. I'd be that, that'd be pretty awesome. But it's just funny, man. I've been doing it for a stretch. So yeah, yeah. yeah, you've been, yeah you've been around we're, we're all getting there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. So. Well, thanks for your time. Uh, this is going to be awesome. I want to do more of these. We're going to keep, keep rolling with this stuff. Uh, we could probably call, but I want to come down to your place. I'll come over to your place. I don't know where you live. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks for your, thanks for your time. Thanks, awesome. Ryan. Right, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening, and thank you to our show sponsors. Can't get enough sledding content? Subscribe to Snow West Magazine at snowwest.com and get seven issues from September through March. Try our awesome new vertical digital format or get magazines mailed to your door. And subscribe to our YouTube channel for the latest sled reviews, interviews, and more.